Now, you know, one would say, does Dre get a pass at being such a notorious woman beater because he makes good music? Andre went up there and got him a spit of watch. He gave it to me for, for everybody. He basically confessed his love to this man. Another man confessed his love to another man. Every time you see one, you see the other one. Next thing you know, start painting their fingernails. It makes sense. It appears Luanelle has delivered the final blow to Diddy's reputation. As her unearthed interview suggests, he's allegedly been engaging in eerie rituals with Dr. Dre. So what exactly is going on? For starters, Shug Knight has claimed that Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre are among those involved in a secret society with Diddy. On an episode of Collect Call with Shug Knight that premiered on March 11th via Dave May's Breakbeat Media, the former music mogul suggested that rappers painting their nails and buying Diddy gifts are indications of them being a part of an exclusive group. Once they start painting their fingernails and wearing women's clothes, they got you, he said. I remember when they was giving Puffy an award at the Ace Cap Awards. Andre went up there and got him an expensive watch and gave it to him in front of everybody. He basically confessed his love to this man. Then Puffy and Snoop became besties. Every time you see one, you've seen the other one. Next thing you know, they start painting their fingernails. Didn't make sense, he continued. The game bought Puffy a Lamborghini when Puffy got more money than game. Why you buying this man a Lamborghini? You know your homies don't even got a Lamborghini. But once again, it's that secret society. For this thing to work and fix it, they gotta start all the way over in these major record labels and these big buildings. They need to get rid of all the guys who is connected to the poison and the snake. Shug Knight has previously talked about Dre, Snoop, and Diddy on his podcast, as well as the aforementioned secret society. Back in February, he referenced the NWA beatmaker's history of violence against women and his participation in said group while defending Chris Brown. You can have a man that's part of that secret society and they gonna give him an award, the Impact Award, he said. That MF beat up more bees than anybody. This man gets an award for beating up women. In any case, this is not the first time someone has spoken about Dre's AB tendencies. In 2021, comedy icon Luanelle discussed Dre's health troubles and noted that not everyone was rooting for him to recover because of his long-standing allegations of DV. At the time, Dre had suffered a brain aneurysm and his fans were worried if he'd make it through. Now, you know, one would say, does Dre get a pass at being such a notorious woman beater? because he makes good music. Luanelle went on to state, one would say that some people ain't gonna be praying for Dr. Dre. A lot of women, but you can get a pass it seems if you're popular. He a notorious WB. I love Dr. Dre's music, don't get it effed up, and I don't wanna see any of our icons die. But I don't, we can't. Some of the charges his wife was making was even that he had been violent with her, Luanelle continued. His track record sucks. Luanelle added that Dr. Dre's alleged violence is a character flaw that he just can't. He might go years and not do it, and and then he might just go off. Nicole Young was not the only ex who has accused the producer of being abusive in their relationship. In 2016, singer Michelle appeared on The Wendy Williams Show, promoting her new Lifetime biopic, Surviving Compton, Dre, Shug, and Me. Michelle discussed the years of physical abuse she allegedly suffered from Dr. Dre. She talked about staying in an abusive relationship with Dr. Dre. I stayed because it was normal. After the first hit, you don't think they're going to do it again. I didn't call the police because I didn't want him to go to jail. All the men around me were always going to jail and would be gone for years and I didn't think that was a good idea. I just took it as a way of him showing me he loved me. Nicole Young reportedly filed a lawsuit claiming that Dr. Dre that she was ejected from their home following an alleged night of Andre's alcohol-induced brutal rage. In any case, this is not the first time we have heard of such acts of violence being done by members of this alleged secret society to their women. Just a couple of months ago, Cassandra Ventura, the R&B singer better known by the stage name Cassie, had filed her blockbuster lawsuit in federal court against the hip-hop mogul Sean Combs only a day before Combs, a rapper and producer, paid her to drop the suit. In her complaint, Ventura described a pattern of coercive control, A.B., and S.A. perpetrated against her by Combs throughout their more than 13-year relationship, which began in 2005, when Cassie was 19 and had just signed to the 37-year-old Combs Bad Boy Records and ended in 2019. The complaint alleged that Combs plied Ventura with drugs that he beat her, including in one incident in Los Angeles in 2009, after Combs saw Cassie talking to another business agent, which required her to recuperate for a week, that he S.A.'d her repeatedly, including an incident in which he hired male 
Daniel S. workers to S.A. Ventura, which Combs filmed, and again in 2018, when he broke into her house and A. beat her after she attempted to leave the relationship, and that he controlled nearly all aspects of her life, including not only her career, which he allegedly leveraged to keep her silent, but also access to her own medical information and when she was allowed to see her family. Ventura also alleges that after she was romantically linked to another man, Combs told her that he would blow up the man's car. A vehicle belonging to the rival exploded in a driveway shortly thereafter. Anyway, back to Diddy's secret society. So, Cat Williams recently made a guest appearance on Joe Rogan's podcast, and they went on for a whopping three hours, dropping wisdom bombs left and right. Among the many topics they covered, they couldn't resist touching on the infamous Illuminati. Cat dropped some truth bombs, suggesting that the allure of the Illuminati lies in its power and the lucrative benefits it offers. It's like a magnet for those hungry for influence and wealth, and it's no wonder people are tempted to explore it. It's a very powerful concept to have and far too lucrative and beneficial to not be attempted. Joe Rogan chimed in, agreeing with Kat's sentiment. He mused about how, if he were in charge of some global power organization, he'd probably try to corrupt every leader out there, showering them with perks like private jets and climate crisis discussions to win their support. But here's the kicker. Kat pointed out that all organizations, including these big Illuminati-like entities, have rules they have to follow. He suggested that over time, these groups age out, making it harder for new blood to get in. That's where characters like Epstein and Weinstein come into play. They knew knew what these powerful figures wanted and provided it, essentially becoming suppliers to their dark desires. Epstein, Weinstein, like these guys um, knew what these extremists liked and provided it. Joe Rogan added fuel to the fire, speculating about what goes down at these exclusive parties hosted by these powerful figures. He mentioned how attendees probably have their devices scanned and locked away, and how there's probably some seriously shady stuff happening behind closed doors. Kat agreed, pointing out that characters like Epstein have existed throughout history, catering to the darkest desires of the powerful elite. That there's some going on behind the scenes to anybody that really wants to control everything. You don't just want to control everything. You want what? to control everything so you can get away with some too. Now, if you're not familiar with Epstein and Weinstein, let's just say they're not exactly the poster boys for good behavior. But before we dive into their sordid stories, let's first break down what this whole Illuminati thing is all about. Now, you've probably heard whispers about the Illuminati lurking behind the scenes of the entertainment industry, right? The big question on everyone's mind, do you gotta be part of this secretive society to make it big in Hollywood? So, what the heck is the Illuminati anyway? Well, it's this shadowy group that's been the subject of countless conspiracy theories for ages. Think powerful folks pulling the strings of world events from the shadows. The whole Illuminati thing traces back to the 18th century in Bavaria, where a dude named Adam Weishaupt founded a secret society called the Bavarian Illuminati. They were all about spreading enlightenment ideals and giving the finger to religious interference in politics. But fast forward to today, and the Illuminati has taken on a whole new life. It's become this ominous concept, with folks speculating about its involvement in everything from politics to pop culture. It's like the boogeyman of conspiracy conspiracy theories, lurking in the dark corners of society. Now let's talk conspiracy theories, specifically, the one about the Illuminati infiltrating the entertainment biz. You've probably heard the whispers about how this shadowy group pulls the strings behind the scenes, shaping the careers of celebs and controlling their destinies. So what's the deal with these theories? Well, they suggest that Illuminati members engage in all sorts of shady stuff, from secret rituals to making Faustian deals for fame and fortune. You see, Kat talked about alleged Baphomet rituals that take place in the industry, which he says is connected to Hollywood's dress-wearing practices for men. Now, these allegations have got some people labeling Kat as crazy, while some claiming that there could be some truth in his theories. If y'all remember, Cassie's lawsuit mentioned Diddy going to great lengths just to set up freak-off sessions. He would allegedly pick out the candles and arrange them in a very precise manner, make Cassie and the male escorts wear masks, and even make her wear specific colors of lingerie and nail polish. What's crazy is that Jean has talked about Diddy being involved in these secret rituals in the past. He once posted on his channel that Diddy hosts these solstice parties where he and his fellow cult members pay homage to certain idols. Gene even mentioned that at these parties, Diddy and other attendees engage in something similar to freak off sessions when they're done with the main ritual event. Because it land on 12, 12 at 12. That's when ritual sacrifices and prayers and everything was given 
to certain idols. Some people think this might be why Kim Porter wanted to distance herself from Diddy so much. Kim's birthday falls on December 15th, the same day Jean mentioned Diddy throws these strange parties. There's speculation that Diddy might have been using Kim in some kind of ritual to control her. Word is, she eventually caught on and tried to leave Diddy, planning to spill the beans. Jaguar Wright even mentioned how Diddy got uneasy when Kim started writing a tell-all book exposing his secrets. According to Jaguar, Diddy allegedly went to great lengths to silence anyone who wanted to spill the beans about his shady dealings. Andre was writing a book right before he died. Heavy D was working on a book before he died. Kim Porter was working on a book. Anyway, another thing Diddy and Dre have in common is how they both use the people who helped them get started. We all know Diddy got a leg up from Andre Harold, but did you know Easy E was the one who rescued Dre when his old crew left him high and dry? Let me break it down for you. Easy E, a pivotal figure in the revolutionary group NWA, played a crucial role in reshaping the landscape of hip hop during the late 1980s and early 1990s. The group's hardcore image and unabashedly explicit lyrics marked a paradigm shift in the genre. NWA's verse boldly tackled various societal vices, laying everything bare and challenging the status quo. However, nine years after the group's formation, the world faced the tragic loss of Easy e due to complications related to AIDS. The question of how someone so influential could easily exit the world highlights the unexpected and devastating nature of his untimely departure. He's not feeling well. And I said, oh, okay, where are we going? He's going to his house? It was odd. It was an odd day. So it's like, you know, I expect that it was possibly a weekday, you know, that we're, you know, I'm going over there like he didn't come pick me up. Rapper Easy e had he lived, would likely have relished his stardom in today's music scene. Unfortunately, his life was tragically cut short in 1995 due to his battle with HIV. Despite his absence, the public has revisited the rapper's legacy through recent releases like Straight Outta Compton. However, the impact of the film extends beyond the audience to Eric Wright Jr., Easy es son, who has had the unique experience of seeing his father brought back to life in a special way through the cinematic portrayal of his iconic journey. Like, why has he asked me that? Like, I don't know. I like everything he does. You know what I mean? Like, but it touched me because you cared to ask me, you know, so it stuck in me. Wright shared his personal journey in an interview with The Recollectors, a storytelling site dedicated to narratives of families who have lost loved ones to AIDS. In the interview, he candidly discusses the experience of growing up with Easy e and the challenges of losing his father at a young age. Coping with the loss, one of the ways Wright found solace and purpose is by actively raising awareness about the disease that took his father's life. Through his advocacy, he strives to contribute to a broad understanding of HIV AIDS and its impact on individuals and families. I started doing AIDS awareness work, Wright told the recollectors. I went out and tested with individuals and campaigned for people to go get checked, talked about what it meant and how it affected me, how it's important to the community. When asked about Straight Outta Compton, which chronicled Easy es rise to fame with the rap group NWA, Wright had good things to say. It brings him to life again, in a positive light, he said. He's being homaged and recognized for how iconic he was for the entire music industry. In any case, prior to his tragic demise, a lot was happening in Easy's life. Despite NWA's meteoric ascent to stardom in the 80s and 90s, thanks to the platinum success of their studio albums, Straight Outta Compton, and NA's For Life, the group's trajectory took an unexpected turn. The band's journey was marred by intense internal conflicts, resulting in diss tracks, threats, and shattered camaraderie. Just as Dr. Dre began the process of reconciliation, the tragic death of Easy e from AIDS in 1995 abruptly ended any chances of a full reunion. And he got it, and so it might have it might have slowed a few people down. I think. Hopefully, it did. Sure. NWA kicked off its journey in 1987 under the leadership of Easy e the mastermind behind Ruthless Records. The initial crew included West Coast artist Dr. Dre, followed by the additions of Ice Cube, Arabian Prince, and DJ Yella. We couldn't stop laughing as we watched folks on the benches freak out because the paintballs were red. Yeah, not long after that, we ended up on the freeway with to our heads dealing with some real AH cops. He continued, we took that crazy experience and hit the studio the same day to make that song. NWA's shift towards a more aggressive and violent style of music and lyrics was a departure for Dr. Easy e reflected on this transition, noting, Dre came from the world-class Reckon Crew, an electro group, but I convinced him to dive into this other kind of music I wanted to do, the gangsta 
The collaboration between Eazy E and Dre marked a significant evolution in the sound and content of their music, contributing to the emergence of gangsta rap. You know, dibbling and dabbling in movies by now, and you know, all forms of entertainment. You know, because he was just such a visionary on what it should be. Eazy E emerged as the most identifiable face of NWA, largely owing to his distinctive appearance. Yella explained the choice, saying, We liked Eazy because initially he had the money, but also because the sound of his voice sold. He sounded and looked like a little kid. That's why we pushed him out front. He was the image. When you thought of NWA, you thought of Eazy E first. It was just a look. Their debut album, Straight Outta Compton, achieved platinum certification by selling a million copies within two years. Ironically, Dr. Dre, a central figure in the group, wasn't a fan of the album. To this day, I can't stand that album, he admitted. I threw that thing together in six weeks so we could have something to sell out of the trunk. Despite Dre's reservations, the album played a crucial role in establishing N.W.A. as a force in the rap scene. Straight out of Compton, crazy one of the band's closest associates and collaborators was the DOC, who penned many of their lyrics. The DOC was Dr. Dre's housemate and close friend, and they both were signed with Ruthless. I spent all day every day with Dre for those first three or four years. I was with this guy all day every day, the Dioc would recall. We slept in the same house, we ate at the same time, we drove to work together in the same beat-up little Toyota Corolla. The Dioc was keen to start a new record label with Shug Knight, one of his other close personal friends. Knight at the time was was running his own artist management company. I was trying to find myself and Shug and I felt like we needed Dre in order to make that S work, the DOC summarized. We had already went through my little contract, Shug and I and other lawyers, and found out that I was not fairly being compensated by Ruthless. With that information, I went to Dre and I started having conversations with him about he and I doing our own thing. If Easy's F me, then he's probably doing it to you too. He's F cube. I just got those kinds of dialogue started. The DOC's attempts to shake Dre's loyalty to Ruthless Ruthless seemed to pay off. Soon enough, Dre started to question the fairness of his current contract. Easy disagreed. What that did was separate Easy E and Dre, the DOC explained. Now that's really all that Shug and me needed to get Dre to come on in where we at, because Dre knew a lot of that creative S came out of me. He knew that he's not going to be able to sit in the studio with Eric and come up with this S, so he comes over here and we get the idea that we're going to start our own label. We're gone split the S 50 50, and Shug is going to help us administrate and do business. The breaking point for NW came with a dispute over their manager, Jerry Heller, whom Dr. Dre and Shug Knight believed was unfairly claiming a significant portion of album profits. Dre confronted Easy about this, stating, I said, listen, man, F all this going back and forth S, either Jerry goes or I go. Dre later recounted, and he looked me in my face and said, I can't get rid of Jerry. That was the end of me and Easy es relationship, he explained. The feeling I had at that moment was similar to losing a brother. It seriously broke my heart. Subsequently, Knight, the DOC, and Dr. Dre established Death Row Records, while Easy chose to stick with Jerry Heller. Death Row went on to thrive, becoming one of the most successful black-owned record labels in history. The split marked a significant turning point in the landscape of West Coast hip-hop. You know, I mean, we were very, very close. So, I could never, I could never really Dislike. Following the fallout, the former friends engaged in a barrage of diss tracks and openly hostile interviews. Easy e summarized the situation at the time, stating, Suge tried to destroy my record company with the help of others, including Dro. So right now we're getting everything back together, and we finna come out, you know, fully loaded. During this turbulent period, reports emerged that Shug Knight allegedly threatened Easy e at gunpoint. Demanding that he sign over the ruthless rights to Dr. Knight was also said to have threatened Easy es family. While these details remain unconfirmed, Knight faced charges for allegedly pistol-whipping two other men in his death row offices. Heller claimed that Easy e considered Knight an evil human being and expressed a desire to harm him. However, the wounds from the shattered friendship with Dre ran even deeper for Easy e The once close collaborators were now entangled in a web of animosity and legal disputes. In his diss track, F. Whitry Day, Dre included the lyrics, rapper Luke Campbell must have thought I was sleazy or thought I was a mark because I used to hang with Easy. 
Despite their rift, Easy e continued to reap financial benefits from Dr. Orb. Basically, I had Dre signed as my exclusive producer and exclusive artist, he explained. So when Dre tried to make his deal over at Interscope, I was included for the next six years. So you can say all you want to say. Basically, you can diss me all you want, but I'm going to get paid. That's why I say Dre Day is only Easy's payday. The contractual ties ensured that Easy e would continue to receive compensation from Dre's future endeavors, turning the diss into a financial win for Easy. When asked why the bandmates wouldn't just make up, he first joked, Dre already made up. You ain't ever seen him with the lipstick? He went on to say that in light of the disses, I don't think I want to make up. Nevertheless, Ice Cube started to reconcile with Easy, as Cube later recalled. We had talked about getting back together, and at the time, our feud had died down, and him and Dre was still at odds. So I was like, if you can get Dre to do it, I'm ready. Easy then called Dre to discuss their disagreements. We started talking about the mistakes we had made in the past, and potentially getting back together and making another record. Dre has stated. It seemed as if a full NWA reunion was on the horizon. So yeah, it's been 30 years, exactly 30 years since we formed the group NWA. Back then, we weren't thinking about form of faith, form, fame or fortune or anything like that. But in 1994, their paths separated even further. Dr. Dre was sentenced to six months in a Pasadena jail, during which he began to rethink his life. In particular, he was haunted by the memory of his brother Tyree, who had recently been killed in a street fight. I just said, let me do a whole 180 with my life, he has remembered. I don't want to do any more negative hip-hop music, I can't be talking about bees. Dre was in jail when he received the news that Eazy E was dying of AIDS, confined to his hospital bed. Upon his release, Dre visited Easy in the hospital, only to find his friend in a comatose state. As the godfather to one of Easy's sons, he supported the children as they symbolically covered their father's casket with dirt. The loss of Easy E and the circumstances surrounding it remained a sensitive and unspoken topic among the former collaborators. In any case, given their shady past, fans have swiftly linked Dr. Dre to Diddy, suspecting they've shared in some dubious dealings. But whether or not they are indeed part of a secret society with Snoop Dogg remains to be seen. Anyway, that's it for this video, folks. Bye.